Hi folks, it's time for my movies by the month, and this time we're going to be looking through the movies that I watched during the month of May of 2020. Yeah, I know it's July, I know I'm working my way through these, so without any further ado, the first film I want to tell you about was a surprisingly slow, deep and interesting one, a semi-political government thriller called The Report. And that's all about Adam Driver, who seems to pop up a lot on these lists, who plays Dan Jones who worked for the Senate Intelligence Committee, and he's asked to investigate the CIA destroying a load of interrogation tapes back in 2009. And that leads him and all his dudes in the wee office to go through thousands of documents, and to start to uncover loads of secrets about the CIA torturing that went on during the War on Terror. Of course, nothing's ever that simple, and it's not only loads of bureaucracy for them to get through, but Dan has to very much deal with the CIA breathing down his neck, because they really don't like the finger being pointed at them. At all. And it's a really interesting film, it's kind of in the same vein as films like All the President's Men or Dark Waters that I watched previously. And there's not an awful lot I could say bad about this movie. It manages to compress an awful lot of complicated stuff into very easy to digest information and spins out a great little story. Also showcasing again that Adam Driver is one of the most versatile actors of his generation. I mean, it's an absolute solid 5 out of 5 from me. Just be prepared to be kind of annoyed with the CIA and the US government by the end of it. Which, to be honest, isn't anything really new these days. Next up is a surprising movie that I ended up watching during a bad film Friday. And that was an indie film called Bocas. Or Bocas. Not sure which. Now Bocas is a movie based on a comic book written, directed and starring a guy called Jake Estrada. Who also wrote the comic book Bocas. And it's all about a Puerto Rican superhero. Who's actually a fallen angel. And is pretty much immortal, super strong and kind of obsessed with killing bad guys. And this movie is being generous kind of a giggle at times, in the so bad it's good kind of way. I mean it's a it's basically a daft home movie version of The Punisher crossed with like the old prophecy movies that had Christopher Walken in them. But the funny thing is, is half of the movie was looked like it was shot in like a local youth centre with Estrada and his mates, and the second half seems to be set in a post-apocalyptic future which they shot out like in an airstrip somewhere or somewhere nearby where the world's supposed to be in ruins and it seems to have been shot about six months later. And at one point even Walking Dead cosplayers turn up at one point and it's, it's really kind of bizarre. But yeah, this is like a two out of five angels for this purgatorial mess of a movie. But sometimes cheap and cheerful just doesn't quite get you there. However, if you do want an example of a cheap and cheerful movie that does get the job done, another film I watched in May was a similarly low budget indie movie but was very different in quality called the Droving. Now unlike Bocas, which looked like it was filmed using a potato, The Droving actually looks like it was shot on fairly high end stuff with pretty decent cinematography and absolutely amazing sound. I mean it's the story of Martin, an ex-soldier who's not long back from serving in Bahrain and it's one year on from the disappearance and presumably the murder of his sister who vanished during The Droving, which is a small folk festival in his hometown. So he starts asking it around and gets right up in people's faces, and he winds his way along a trail of breadcrumbs, uncovering at every step a new person to talk to and intimidate while getting bits of information. And what's really great about this is apparently the crew of the movie was maybe only about 10 folk in total, not like the hundreds or so you'd expect on a proper movie that looks like this. And it's genuinely a very tense and spooky film. It has a kind of eerie quality to it, and it's kind of hard to avoid comparisons with other movies that have a similar idea, because the basic concept is essentially just the Wicker Man, in the way that it goes with like kind of weird folksy stuff with somebody looking for a missing girl and gets caught up in all this kind of woo. But it's also an awful lot like Ben Wheatley's Kill List, which is a pretty much amazing movie, but is kind of a tough watch because it's so horribly gory and unkind. I mean, it makes it kind of difficult to look at. But it sort of follows a lot of the same themes in this, much as it does to also the Shane Meadows film Dead Man's Shoes, which is basically the same concept about an ex-military guy coming back to town and then going round from person to person beating them up, but without the folk horror bent that the droving has. I mean, it's not a perfect film. You can see the seams sometimes and the budgetary constraints do become a bit obvious during moments like the stunt scenes, but it's still a pretty good wee movie. I mean, I would be happy to give this like a 4 out of 5. It's a great wee indie title to check out. But I hear you cry, what would a list like this be like without a gloriously awful piece of trash that was trying to be good? Well, it would probably be something like The Final Wish. Now, The Final Wish is an absolute cracker of a bad movie, you know, taking the same kind of idea that made the Wishmaster movies momentarily amusing in the late 90s and regurgitating it in a really tired and cheap way. Failed law student Aaron has to go back from the big city where he's got no work and no money because his dad died, but when he gets back he finds everything's a bit strange and there's a weird urn in his dad's possessions and he finds his wishes all of a sudden start getting granted, but in weird ways that don't quite work out and aren't always great because gins are tricksy bad guys. 
Anyway, loads of stupid things happen, and there's a subplot about his ex-girlfriend and his mental mother, and there's some kind of weird setups about how the actor has a crappy lip scar prosthetic, and then he wishes he was better looking, so he gets hit by a car, and then suddenly when they take the bandages off, the scar's gone, and that's the only difference. I mean, it's that kind of lame, tired film. Anyway, it's two out of five at best, don't waste your time, not even for cameos by Lin Shay and Tony Todd, who are great stalwart actors in the genre. But this is just rubbish, so skippity skip, skippity skip, 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 this trash. What wasn't total trash though was one of the new movies that came up on Netflix during May, and that was Extraction, which is all about the guy who plays Thor being an alcoholic mercenary brought in to rescue the son of an Indian crime boss that's been kidnapped and ransomed by other bad guys. Basically, so far, so taken. But all of this goes horribly wrong, and his team get all deaded by the crime boss's lieutenant who hired them but doesn't actually want to pay for them, so this leads to a game of cat and mouse as Thor and the boy have to run through the streets of the city trying to escape while the lieutenant and the corrupt cops and corrupt army guys and also the henchmen for the city's main crime boss start going after them and are chasing them down all the way to the extraction point. And the thing is, it's pretty much just a roller coaster ride of a movie, complete with an absolutely amazing 20 minute sequence which is all made to look like it's all one continuous shot. Remember how I said like how they did that in 1917? Well, this is amazing because this wasn't like a hundred million pound epic movie. It's a relatively modest budget film. So most of this was actually done with practical effects and real cars and real stunts happening and very little in the way of CGI trickery or green screening. Apart from the guns, because apparently they weren't actually allowed to use real black firing guns because of local laws. So all the guns in that are basically just fake ones and they've added fake gunshot flashes at the end and everything. It's a perfect Friday night giggle if you want just to see some crash bang wallop stuff and action and... Plenty of him off Thor smashing things up and so that'll keep the ladies happy and you've even got the dude from Stranger Things turning up at one point. So yeah, I mean, I'll give this 4 out of 5 and say you'll have a good time if you watch this. Just don't expect, you know, Schindler's List or something. And to start to round things off, the last film I saw was The Signal, a quirky low budget sci-fi film about three conspiracy loving hacking students on a road trip across country looking for another hacker who broke into their college server a while back. But when they get to the place where they think the guy is, things go kind of crazy weird and the main lad wakes up in a medical facility where Morpheus from the Matrix is testing him about stuff and things just get weirder and weirder from then on. Now, The Signal isn't a bad film and I'm being a bit vague about it on purpose because it's one where the mysteries are actually quite interesting as they're uncovered. But it's also a film that gets more than a little bit infuriating because a lot of the logic's really broken and some of it isn't half as clever as it thinks it is. Also, the narrative is way more concerned with ideas than telling you a story that holds together. And there's a lot of moments where characters and the things they do don't make a lot of sense and the film just wants you to fill in the blanks yourself. Still, it's a very low budget film that does an awful lot with very little and it has some really good turns in it. It's by a guy called William Eubank who made a previous sci-fi movie called Love, which was really well regarded, although I haven't actually seen it myself, but it does always pop up on the rotation on Prime and Netflix every now and again. But yeah, if you want a little bit of thinky sci-fi and you've already seen films like 2001 and Annihilation and Ex Machina, then you can definitely do a lot worse than watching this middling but charming 3 out of 5 sci-fi flick. And as an extra special little bonus, I'm going to mention that during May, I also watched the first season of the show Future Man. Now, I know a lot of you guys are big fans of time travel shows, and Future Man is basically a massive parody of films like Terminator, Back to the Future, and it's got a whole load of jokes about other classic 80s movies thrown in. And the plot is kind of simple and... We've come back from the year 2160. The game is a recruitment and training tool sent back in time to find the one person with the skills to save us. That's the last Starfighter. It's the exact same plot as the movie. What's a, what's a movie? Yeah, it's basically that simple, and things do spiral out of control, and a lot of the comedy is basically about how inept these time travellers are, and how out of place they are, and how much of a complete dafty Josh Futterman, yeah, that's his name, is at, because all his knowledge effectively comes from video games and from movies. Still, a warning, the comedy is very silly and often very, very crude, but if you're okay with swearing and poop jokes, then you might have a very good time with this. I certainly did. So May's TV show recommendation is Future Man. And that was May. And unlike previous videos, I've actually already started on the June video, so we're going to be up to date pretty soon. And in the meantime, please do follow me on Twitter, at Grumpy Opinions. Honestly, I don't bite, just go and chat to me there. Also, there's a Facebook group, at Grumpy Opinion, which I didn't manage to get the one with the S, but never mind. And if you're feeling really generous, you can always sign up to my Patreon. And remember, all the details for this are down in the description below. And remember, I do lots of other TV shows as well as these movie rundowns, so you can find my thoughts on shows like Outlander, Handmaid's Tale, The Mandalorian, Catch-22, His Dark Materials, or even the final season of Game of Thrones. It's all there, just check out the playlists. And until next time, I've been Ian, and these have been my grumpy opinions.
and a special thanks to everybody listening and especially my patrons and most especially to Michelle Forbes and Judith Coloma, my top tier patrons. Thank you everybody. Everybody stay safe. Cheerio.